for having us in this awesome space. You know, we were talking earlier about how we did a show once at a venue that as it got darker and darker, we realized that there was no bulbs in the fixtures in the space, so we performed completely in the dark for the rest of the show. So this is fantastic. This is a big upgrade. Thank you so much. Anyway, my name is Chris Baranato. I'm Megan Ave Lalamont, and I'm new to the stage, but I'm a longtime fan of Sears Sucker. She's my new co-host. I'm very excited about that. Now, now we always like to start everything with a. Uh, well, first I'd like to ask a question. Uh, how many people in here um, uh, like books? Like, keep your hands up. You. You. And you, sir. I need you all up on the stage. You got. You got. Now we're going to be playing a game okay, called Fictionary, not Pictionary, but Fictionary. Thank you. You all are very lucky because uh, we're, we're, we're putting you on some teams. Oh, oh, there oh, I got you, I got you. Have. Okay. So uh, I'd like to also invite our, our three authors up to the stage. Yeah, you guys get to play. So you can partner up with this gentleman right here. What's your name, sir? Connor. Connor. Oh, Taylor, you can begin partner up. These are the teams. I'm a mosey on over. Yeah. How are y'all doing? Like that? <laughs> What's your name? Juliet. Oh, Laura. Laura. All right. All right. Okay. Now, uh, now we're gonna ask Chris and Laura yeah. to step aside for a second because we only have two easels. We're gonna do this in like kind of like uh, rounds. And uh, you all, you've all played Pictionary before. This is called Pictionary. We're going to give uh, each team the title of the book, and they need to draw it. One of them needs to draw it, and one of them needs to identify what it is. Sit back down. We need something else. Okay. 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 So he has to guess. That's yes. right. You have That's to draw. Right. Sorry, Oh, okay. okay. okay I After you're done, we need to show the other. They're going to draw the same thing. You got it? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Oh, they have to draw the same thing. Who's, who's, who's drawing? Do you want to draw or you want me to? I want to draw. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Trisha's a terrific artist. She uh, draws in all of her books when she signs them, so. Uh... You got it? <laughs> okay. Place all right. Place. Brian, we're going to need some drawing music. Wait a minute. It's going to be for Twinkle, Twinkle, Twinkle Little Star. That's all you got. <laughs> <laughs> all right, can you start? Are you starting? Oh, yeah. Okay, Are go ahead. Going? Go. Yeah, this is a short show, so we got to get going. <laughs> can we guess? No, 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 no. Not yet. Oh, yeah, you can help me. Oh, you got it? I know that. Great to breath. Great to breath. Oh, you can help me. Did you not draw anything? It's unclear. <laughs> We salute you, and for that, we ask you to stay on the stage. Woo! 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 Woo!
uh, systematically. We're going to count to three. The music will begin. On three, the drawing will begin. Okay? Audience, you just send them good vibes. That's your job. Yeah? Okay, ready? One, two, three. Uh, Treasure Island. Uh, lost at Sea. Moby Dick. <laughs> Harry Potter and the Silver Stone. Lord of the Flies. Okay, we need, we need uh, Trisha and her teammate back up. This is the final round. This is for the win. The championship. Super Bowl. Yeah, you can be over here now. Good job. Oh, yes. I saw the Judeo Christian interview. I was like, I gotta be there. With the kids on the island. Yeah. That was good. That was really good. Now show me. Excellent. Can you do it? Oh, we're gonna find out. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> okay? Yeah. <laughs> Alright. Megan, give it that count off. Okay, ready? Audience, can you help me, please? Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Um, I'm it's a cross. Um, the Bible? Is it the Bible? <laughs> it's not the Bible. Right, cool. It's not the Bible, but it's Bible adjacent. It's Bible adjacent. Uh, uh, veggie Tales, Bible adjacent. Veggie Tales. Right, veggie tales. That's cool. Uh, what's this story? Ooh, we have a we have a wiping of the slate. We have to try a different strategy. Have you tried writing the words? That is not allowed. Oh, okay. <laughs> Loving basketball. <laughs> As I lay dying. Um, There were other choices. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 You did a good job. I just didn't know that that's what it was. Don't leave yet. We do have a prize for you. Did we, did we not stay on stage? We have uh, okay. both of uh, Trisha's oh! books in Italian. Oh. Thank you so much for coming. That's the end of the show. It was uh, really wonderful. Thank you. All right. Uh, so again, uh, I'm Chris Baranato. I'm still Megan. Welcome to Sea Sucker Live again. Uh, we want to thank Front Ports for having us. We want to thank our readers for coming. And uh, we had some banter planned for this, but I think I just want to jump into it. I think first we should reading. go. Yeah. So we'd like to invite Taylor Brown up to the stage. I'm loving Where do you want me? Oh, wherever you want. Closer to the mic's probably better. Hello. Okay. Hello. Taylor, uh, we asked the same question. We, for 10 years now, we've been asking the same question of our authors, but uh, who the hell are you? <laughs> I'm Taylor. <laughs> now, your novel, uh, Wing Walkers, famously weaves the line or the lives of your characters with the real life exploits of author William Faulkner. And some have praised your writing as Faulkner esque. Given that, uh, oh, and, uh, and also, uh, a lot of his books take place in, uh, in an invented county called uh, Yakpinat uh, County. Mm -hmm. Can you spell it? Oh, man. <laughs> Y O K N A P A T A P H A W P H A D 
WPHA. Oh, you're so close, but uh, county is actually spelled C O N T Y. Okay. Um, uh, so, one more question for you. This is kind of a deep one. Uh, where do you go to write? Where do you go to cry? And are they the same place? <laughs> All too often. All too often. Um, I go to Perk in the mornings. I go to Foxy in the afternoon. And then from there, I usually go to Starlin Yard, Woo. sit in a little corner. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Everyone, Taylor Brown. <laughs> Thank y'all for having me. Um, we moved here in fall 2019, and I think that was around the time that Searsucker faded out, you know, and then uh, COVID hit, so uh, this is my first seersucker experience, so I'm pretty excited. Um, I want to read to y'all from uh, a chapter in the book where, so he, he hit on it a little bit, but uh, Wing Walkers follows, takes a little snippet from William Faulkner's life and reimagines some characters in a night he had in New Orleans in 1934. And leading up to that point, it kind of follows Faulkner's life from this aviation angle. And it's kind of this unknown part of his life uh, that I just saw. I was in Oxford, uh, I was in Square Books in Oxford, Mississippi, 2016, and I saw this picture of Faulkner uh, on the wall. And it wasn't the Faulkner you normally see with this pipe and his gray hair and looking like this dawn of, of literature. He was, he was barely out of his teens and he had on an RAF uniform. He had a cane, he was kind of striking this, uh, he, he had a pretty, you know, kind of pretty rakish figure. Had a cane, his, his flying cap cocked on bowl, this little cigarette sticking out the corner of his mouth. Come to find out later, his mother had taken these photos of him. Um, but he had gone off during World War I and, and tried to join uh, the, the RAF and become a fighter pilot. And while it remains dubious that he earned his wings, he came back to Mississippi in an uh, officer's uniform, affecting a limp. Then he said he got in a crash. Uh, metal said he had a metal plate in his head. He'd bang it and tell people, you know, and say, can you hear it? It's the only metal they gave me. Um, so, uh, and most people don't realize that he, uh, his last name didn't even have a U in it. Uh, he put the U in because he thought it would look more British because he thought he had to be uh, a British citizen to join the Royal Air Force. And uh, this scene uh, reimagines when he went to go enlist. And uh, most of the stuff that happens in here is, uh, is, is based on true stuff, out of biography and anecdotes from brothers, you know, and stuff like that. So this is New York, uh, 1918, uh, Chapter 9. It's called Cadet Faulkner, and it starts with the RAF enlistment officer uh, speaking to him in his office. A God-fearing young Christian gentleman, read the enlistment officer, a young man of firm moral fiber and proper ideals who wishes only to place his life in service of the crown. Bill, as Faulkner uh, is, you know, went by as his first name, Bill stood full long before the man's desk, his hands clasped behind his back, the slightest smile curling beneath his scant new mustache. The officer was le reading from a letter of reference written and posted to his office by Reverend Mr. Edward Twimberley Thorndike of London, England. Bill had forged the looping flattery of the vicar's letter beneath the light of a coal oil lamp in a friend's cramped apartment and then mailed it to the sister of an English friend who posted it back here to the Fifth Avenue office of Wing Commander Lord George Wellesley of the Royal Air Force. The recruitment officer set aside the work of fiction, lifting another paper from his desk. William Cuthbert Faulkner, he read, says here you were born in Finchley in the county of Middlesex and to the Church of England. Why, yes, Lieutenant, said Bill, pronouncing it Lieutenant in the Londoner's accent he'd been cultivating for the past several weeks. Trucks were lorries, jelly was jam, the government were a bunch of fools. That's Faulkner with a U, he said, unlike the colonial spelling. <laughs> the officer grunted. And your mother resides now in the town of Oxford, Mississippi? As have I, Lieutenant, since primary school, just a little postage stamp in cotton country. The officer, garbed in his powder blue airman's uniform, cut his eyes over the sheet. It seems you have retained your accent after all these years. 
Bill leaned forward from the waist, dropping his voice. I wouldn't want to sound like one of these continentals, would I, sir? Here he went. The Englishman's face didn't change. His flying cap hung from a hook in the corner. Perhaps not, he said. He laid the paper aside and set both hands flat before him, pressing himself upright from his chair. Then he took up a cane and came walking around the front of the desk, rocking straight knee on one leg. Bill tried not to gawk. Bloody stop with Campbell, he said, banging the cane against his wooden leg. Devil's own machine. Bill had seen the craft in photographs, a barrel-shaped fighter with stubby wings, synchronized machine guns, and a giant propeller. The officer stood before him. Offers a pilot three choices, does the camel. Victoria Cross, Red Cross, or Wooden Cross. He tapped his leg again with a cane. You see which I received, and lucky to have it. Now he swung out his hand as if to shake, but instead pointed to a Detecto two-in-one scale set against the wall, which measured height and weight. Now, Mr. Faulkner, let us make sure you meet the king's requirements. Bill balked. These hated scales, his bane. Are you aware, sir, that the average height of a medieval knight, based on surviving suits of armor, was but 65 inches from sole to crown? Well, Mr. Faulkner, you had better be 66 to join the Royal Air Force. A man must reach the rudder pedals after all. On the scale, please, and remove your shoes. Faulkner chewed the inside of his mouth, looking from the man to the scale. He tried everything to grow taller. Milk and spinach and bunches of bananas, even ginseng powder purchased behind the glazed and dangling ducts of Chinatown. Now he snorted and pulled off his shoes, and stepped onto the device with first one foot, then another, as if testing pond ice. The needle wound lazily toward the 120 pound hash, but lost momentum, hovering at 113 pounds. The one-legged lieutenant drew a ruler from his tunic and held it atop Faulkner's head, measuring his height. You were standing on your toes, sir. <laughs> I can't help it, said Bill. I have very tight Achilles tendons. <laughs> Stand flat-footed, Mr. Faulkner, and now. Bill's heels clapped down hard, jumping the needle, and the officer waited for the device to quit shaking before he took his measurement. 65 and one-half inches, he said, half an inch short. I'm sorry, Mr. Faulkner, but I'm afraid you don't meet the minimum requirements of the Royal Air Force. Faulkner leapt off the scale. You must be mistaken, sir. All cadets must be at least five and one-half feet tall, Mr. Faulkner, or 66 inches. So round up. The RAF does not round. So fudge it. Surely you fudge. I'm sorry, Mr. Faulkner, but I'm afraid we cannot use you. Bill felt his blood rise from the floor, his body gaining at least half an inch in pure outrage can't use me. Well, we'll just have to find someone who can, won't we? We'll just have to see who else is in dire need of airmen at the moment. The officer clapped his hands behind his back. Mr. Faulkner. Faulkner stomped to the door in his sock feet and spun crisply on one heel, cocking an eye. Tell me, Lieutenant, which way to the German embassy? <laughs> the flying officer met his gaze and held it, eyes keen, as if searching the sky for enemy fighters. After a moment, Bill turned and grasped the door handle like a control yoke, casting his chin over his shoulder to bid the man adieu, along with his dreams of becoming an airman. Just as he opened his mouth, the officer spoke. It seems you satisfy the requirements of the Royal Air Force after all, Mr. Faulkner. You've the steel we need in pilots, I see. He bent to his desk and scratched crisp black letters on an RAF document and slid it across the table. Your signature, please. Bill, buoyed by his own bluff, his belly tight as a drum, strode the five steps to the desk, took up the pen, and scrawled his name on the proper line. William Cuthbert Faulkner was to report for flight training in Toronto in one month's time, a cadet for pilot. Papers in hand, he turned to leave. 
The officer rapped the floor with his cane. Forgetting something, Mr. Faulkner? He pointed at the pair of $12 shoes lying forgotten by the scale. Bill looked down at his argyle feet, on which he would have gone slapping down the sidewalk of Fifth Avenue like a madman or tramp. He set the stamping on his shoes, using the backs of two fingers as a shoehorn. The officer watched him. And another thing, Mr. Faulkner, you can come off the bloody accent. A man not me not be a British citizen, nor even a territorial, to serve at His Majesty's Royal Air Force. The next officer may not be so amused. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you. Now, uh, okay. um, this is the part of the show where uh, we do something usually called Good Literary Citizen. And uh, the way Good Literary Citizen works is we bring uh, someone up to the stage, either, you know, someone maybe who's never published before, read before, and to read something, uh, or get someone to, you know, read a book that they want to recommend. Uh, but considering the importance of things that are going on right now, uh, we, we're calling this segment Good American Citizenship, and uh, Megan can tell you all about it. Well, Sears Sucker fans, as you know, elections are coming up. We've got a lot on the ballot next Tuesday, like Commissioner of Agriculture. It's not just the important governor's race. It's local and other statewide positions too. So these things matter, and we need everybody to get out there on Tuesday and vote. Take a friend to vote. Do what you need to do. Get people to the polls. Oh. Uh, <laughs> everyone, we just want to remind you that uh, the beer, the bar is open. So go ahead and uh, get a drink. And the runoff. Cheers, uh, Oh, yeah, please. The runoff is December 6th, for real. <laughs> All right, so early voting is going to start November 28th. So, for real, there's a runoff. If you're registered in Georgia, let me hear you. Okay. <laughs> we'll see you at the polls. And the bar is still Please get a drink. I'm going to invite our second reader, Chris Williams, up to the stage. Y'all may know Chris Williams. Uh, he's a Savannah native, <laughs> wizard of metaphors, oh some of the best period of language I've literally ever heard. <laughs> um, a super hilarious person and cast member here at Front Porch Improv. Yeah. <laughs> and a writer. Thanks. Savannah. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to put this up here so they switch. Do you want to hand it back and forth? What do you no, I'm going to sit down. You want to sit? Okay, yeah. all right, let me get you set up. And, uh, yeah. Ooh, yep, thank you. And I'm a short guy, so yeah, there we go. Can y'all hear me? We good? Yeah. I think that's all right. Sweet. Okay. okay. First question. Oh, first question. Oh, all right. Yeah. yeah. yeah Fuck yeah. Let's do it. All Who right, the cool. hell are you? Uh, I'm Chris. <laughs> uh, I'm from uh, Savannah. I grew up here. It was very different. It was uh, a lot less white people. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, um, SCAD came and did their thing, you know, that's, <laughs> you know how that goes. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm from here, I went to Georgia Southern, then I lived in Atlanta, then I moved back here, uh, not on purpose, I came back, like, to visit for Thanksgiving 2016, and I ended up, like, dating somebody while I was there, so I was like, well, I gotta get a fucking job if I'm here, and then that turned into, like, seven, six years, or whatever, so yeah, now I'm here. Well, welcome back. Yeah, I'm glad to be back, I've, uh... Falling in love with Savannah as an adult, I uh, did the typical hometown thing of hating my hometown when I was a child, but now that I'm an adult, I, uh, I really love it, so yeah. Well, uh, some of you might know that we also have here the grand champion of Button Poetry's video contest for 2021. That was me! That was me! That was me. <laughs> so, your, your poem... The Sound of Surrender creates a really evocative list of things that lasted longer than the Confederacy. Um, in that vein, what do these three things have in common, Chris? Okay. Fuji apples, a Swiffer duster, okay. and a bottle of Mylanta. 
I feel like they'd be in like a middle-aged lady's house. <laughs> we're close. Okay. <laughs> they can all be bought at Kroger. Oh, and I love Kroger. My Kroger car be saving me so much money. Yo. <laughs> hey, Kroger candles. We have Kroger got some good-ass candles. Like, I'm not gonna lie. You catch some Kroger candles on sale for like six ninety-nine. You can get a good Tuscany candle at Kroger. Thank you. But, uh, not, yeah. a sponsor, not a sponsor. No, but no, I but uh, I love that. <laughs> I think that's my only fan screen name, Tusty Candles. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and finally, awesome. where do you go to write? Where do you go to cry? <laughs> and are they the same place? Um, I like writing outside, so I'll uh, I'll be writing at Daffin Park. Uh, sometimes I'll be at like Mood Write or something, and I'll sit at like the little picnic table out front and write, or if I'm at a house party, you can find me like out in the backyard. Right, I'm very emo. Like I just <laughs> wherever that's at, like so. I'll usually cry in them places too, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're done with the questions, and now. Thank you. Thank you so here much. Here for you. No, not thank you to the questions, but thank you for the whole thing. Chris Williams. That's, thank you. <laughs> um, how are y'all doing? How are y'all doing? Y'all are great. Cool. Um, I'm gonna just read a couple like short things that are kind of slash poems slash fictions or whatever. Um, the first thing I'm gonna read was actually um, a prompt that I got from my friend Kadia, who is. <laughs> One of the most fantastic writers I've ever met. Um, the prompt was to personify Savannah as a person, uh, the city of Savannah. So I'm just going to read it real quick and pull out my phone and then pull that up. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> a tipsy drag queen stands in the checkout line of fancy parkers at 2 a.m., holding tight to a box of chicken fingers like dignity. She sways softly to the music in her head as the choir of angels at McDonough's sings ushers nice and slow off key. She reaches out a gloved hand like the old black southern church lady she is and lifts a donut lovingly from the case. In the checkout line is a debutante ball for sinners. She knows you must be excommunicated to be accepted into this etiquette school. So her holy water is gin and her palm Sunday is a floor covered in lingerie. Her Pentecost is a blunt Everyone in the room was blessed with fire last night. Lovers call out her confirmation name, and confessions happen best with the door open. The body of Christ, broken apart, shared and devoured, swallowing divinity, the sound of swallowing swallowed up by the humidity. And that's Savannah to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Appreciate that. Um, I, I grew up uh, very, very Catholic. I'm not Catholic anymore, but I, uh, it's, it's definitely an influence on in my life. So, so uh, this next poem um, was inspired by the Back River. It's one of the best spots on Tybee to me. I don't really like going to the main beach. I'm either North Beach or Back River. So um, it's called Back River and also has some like Catholicism influences in there. I lost my feet in the changing sand as I stepped towards the shore. I looked for them with my hands, and I made little river deltas in the shallows of the tide. I reached under every bubble, curious if my toes were still there, but feeling okay if I lost them. I lost sight of my friends when they pulled off their legs and turned back into mermaids. I picked up sand and made it mud with my cupped fingers. My hands became a chalice of clay filled with salt water. I sat cross-legged baptizing myself while a convent of seagulls read out loud from the Bible of salt and air. They were singing the same hymn, but different parts at once. They were all the Virgin Mary with their white flappy veils for wings in the breeze. They flapped and cried, and their wings beat at the tomb of the wind, rolling back an Easter Sunday of salt spray. I was comfortable in this church. The pews were being pulled into the altar, one grain of sand at a time, an uncountable amount of prayers under the wash at every high tide. And that's the back river. <laughs> I, uh, I tend to like prefer like short things. I like to like just say what I want and get the fuck out. I don't want to waste people's time too much. So uh, that had like a little longer part because I wrote that um, for the Gray's Reef um, opening, like Marine Discovery Center. But I didn't like the rest of it, so I just cut that shit. But I just yeah. <laughs> if you go there, I think they have the full poem displayed. But I just wrote the last part for them, so y'all got the real version. Um, Thank you. So, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> um, so I'm wearing a compression glove because I am a writer with arthritis. I've had arthritis almost all my life. 
Um, and this year is the first year I've had health insurance, so I've been able to like, yeah, to turn up the health insurance. Yeah. yeah. So um, my body's recovering, but it's still like, you know, a lot of damage. So I've been writing a series of poems about arthritis, and um, this is one I wrote. It's simply called Arthritis Two. When the bones in your right hand have ground up against each other too much, your hand feels like a latex glove filled with sand and rock chips mushing around together when you move your fingers or wrist. Or is it a twist of knots rotted with dead barnacles pulled taut to a post? Suppose it is a tiny snake inside of your forearm constricting your ligaments into a mash, easy enough to swallow and lay fat in the sun, swollen with a still living thing being liquefied for digestion, I guess. An immune system is an apex predator, and a joint disease is a pack of hyenas laughing in the dark, the cracking of joints like teeth clacking. Yeah. That's what it's like to have arthritis. <laughs> um, so, um, how much time do I got left? Oh, <laughs> fuck yeah, all right. <laughs> um, this is a little bit longer, it's, a, it's not too long. It's a, Non-fiction piece, um, a friend of mine um, who I really like, we went to Starling Yard and had dinner one day. So this is kind of just what happened that day. It's called Starling Yard. <laughs> the two friends laughed out loud at how dragonflies have shovel-shaped penises, and all the people at Starling Yard looked disturbed over their pizza and whiskey. She chuckled at the tiny sailboats on his collared shirt. Cartographer lines and compasses covered it all over. The sunset flickered behind her hair while he accidentally sprayed some of his lemonade on her from laughing too loud. She wiped it off with a napkin that to him was folded like a tiny sail before laughing back. They spent the sunset talking about cat penises and other animal facts, snacking on food truck delicacies together being weird. They were in a tiny sailboat of a friendship, and the ocean moved at a comfortable pace. They finished eating as the sky turned a shade of pink that felt like a Frank Ocean song. And after they paid for their food and walked down DeSoto towards their cars, an old woman stopped them to talk about littering. Growing off the side of the building and out of the alleyway were ferns and flowers. So this old woman had the feel of a witch or a sassy wisteria that had grown <laughs> hips in an attitude. The two friends always saw flowers when they walked together. So it would make sense if this woman was really a flower in disguise waiting for someone who could speak leaf and petal. They assured the wisteria woman that no one would litter on their watch, and they would watch out for trash as well as park in such a way to not block the lane. The wind picked up, and the sails on his shirt blew west towards the shrinking light of the sun. By now the sky was the shade of a dry grape juice stain on cotton. She smiled goodbye at him, and the corners of her lips were sails filled up with the warm breeze, pulling her down the highway home and away as she drove off in her car. Yeah, that's about uh, yeah. having a little crush on somebody. Uh, uh, I was watching my neighbor's dog like the other week, and I got bit, so I wrote this like as I was cleaning up the blood. <laughs> um, for like reference, uh, Kenny Mason is a rapper from Atlanta, and um, in a lot of his music, he references dogs and puppies. Um, that's like a running motif for him, so he's mentioned in this, and that's a little explanation as to why. It's called Dog Days. I got bit by my neighbor's dog pretty bad. Through the precipice of the finger flesh at the wash of the nail bed right through the cuticle. A lot of blood and it really hurt, but still it was exactly what I've been looking for. I've always been convinced I had some connection with wolves or dogs. I think a lot of artsy black men circa early 30s feel that way for some reason. <laughs> a very Kenny Mason-esque notion, I suppose. My therapist has been helping me to learn to forgive myself and also forgive others. To be able to show kindness when I'm in pain or disappointed. Not to say these things can't affect me, but my own personal aspiration is to not let them affect how I treat others while also processing these things for myself. So it was nice to have to practice kindness in the midst of hurt or disappointment. We went for a good walk and ran some lazy suicides until we both had to poop. He had a really earthy poop. It felt, like I had, it felt like had I left it there, it would eventually become a grassy hillside where foxes play. <laughs> That's about cleaning up too. <laughs> um, I guess I'm just gonna finish with like an unfinished um, 
prompt, uh, there was a contest on like vocal for like writing a story about dragons. Like the guy that wrote Aragon was like gonna judge it, but I just, I never finished the shit. So this is like, a, the, the, the prompt was you had to write a story about like a dragon finding a kid or some shit like that. So this is what I wrote. It's called Moonchild. It has like a nice little ending. And um, thank y'all for you alls time. I love writing fiction, so it's cool to, it's my first time I read some fiction out loud. The dragon nudged the small brown baby in the grass with his scale knuckled as the child laughed. Sunlight painted the dragon's silhouette with a gentle fiery glow as she cocked her large head to the side and stared hard at the child. The baby was amusing itself by fidgeting with a crescent moon-shaped pendant draped around its neck tied with shoestring. The dragon looked up at the open sky. It seemed to spill out in a dome over the soft meadow she found the child in, her goldenrod eyes fixed on the daytime moon. She let out a weary sigh and then closed them. Her next exhale came out as a cloud of red, sparkling smoke. The noxious effects of smoke seemed to have no effect on the child as it simply giggled, watching the smoke envelop the dragon. When the smoke dissipated, the dragon was gone and a young woman with dark skin stood in its place. She wore armor of obsidian and around her waist a sword. I feel like I can handle you a bit better like this. The woman spoke with a wry grin, taking a step forward towards the child and picking it up. The child cooed happily as the, women bit, as the woman bent down for a close, closer look. The dragon-turned woman peered curiously at the baby's soft, squishy nose and how it scrunched up with every laugh. She investigated the baby's curly brown hair with fingers light and whispery. She seemed to forget something important when the child's warm brown eyes met her fiery gold ones. The woman paused before saying, Hello, my name is Diana. I will be your knight. Diana then picked up the baby who would be queen, cradling, cradling the child softly. And that's as far as I got on that. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, thank y'all for y'all's time. You can see a lot of people I know in the audience, that's super cool. Hey, Dr. Griffith, right? Yeah, awesome. He's a scam professor I visit for my job. He's super cool. Uh, thank all the people I know for coming out, and thank y'all for having me here. Thank you. introduction, but it's getting one anyway. So without further ado, Chris Marinato is going to play an original song that he composed for tonight on his Nintendo. Danger starting it right now. Our sound man. Thank you to our sound man. Okay, <laughs> so uh, raise your hand if you've tried to write a book but you never got around to finishing it. <laughs> raise, your, <laughs> raise your hand if you have an idea for a book you've been afraid to even start it. I have one I've been thinking about for about 15 years now. And this song's about, yeah, longer than that, exactly. I need to bring up some backup singers for this one, actually. So uh, this song is for all of you, and for me, who have trouble writing a book. I literally wrote this today, so bear with me. That's why I have this. Okay. I dreamt the magic course that wants to be a book. When I try to write it down, I'm filled with crippling fear. Eternal rabbit holes on YouTube, Reddit, Facebook. Find ways to waste my time. But then I softly hear the clay clack of the Smith Corona hanging bound out of the coffee shop. Scrit scratch of a feathered quill. Shipping Harry Potter in a Twilight family. Tap tap of a MacBook Pro. Ghost writing memoirs in a fancy lake house. Every story is beautiful. It takes no effort at all. Write a book. It's easy, just write a book. It's easy, just write a book. It's easy, it takes no Write a book. It's easy, just write a book. It's easy, just write a book. It's easy, it takes no effort at all. Yeah, that's a wind clap. High horses galloping 
into the far flung future. Poor trash and still going. The suffering never ends. Swimming in alcohol. Hide from rejection letters. I think it's Sheldon it. But then I hear my friends go click clack on a Smith Corona. <laughs> Shipping Harry Potter. Oh, you're the one. Great scratch on the feather quill. Shipping Harry Potter as a Twilight fanfic. Tap tap on a map of pro. Ghost writing memoirs in a fancy lake house. <laughs> Every story is beautiful and takes no effort at all. Write a book, it's easy. Write a book, it's easy. Write a book. so much. That was the musical interlude. <laughs> okay, now for our next and final reader, I would like to bring up Trisha Lockwood. Now she has to follow along. That's my turn left. ask you some song lyrics, but I decided to get the... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Show, so. <laughs> okay, okay. I've been really nervous about this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, we're not going to ask you who the hell you are. I think this is... Uh, the first time you ever read was on our show. Yeah, you, it This was. is, what, your fourth time now? Yeah, whatever. Yeah, I mean, there's some, something like any that. Any number, say any number, and I would agree. Yes, <laughs> I've read here many times. Yeah, so considering that the first time you ever read was on our show, mm -hmm. uh, we'd like to know what you've been up to since we launched your career. <laughs> you really, really did. I mean, it was it was my absolute first reading. It was down on River Street. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. It was Kevin Berries. Uh, uh, yes. Berries. Kevin Berries, Daniel Handler. And I, ever since it's been completely downhill. I have published <laughs> a couple books, but I have not read again at Kevin Berries. <laughs> so, it was like 9-11 was still happening inside there. It was like just flags, and there was like an eagle's 